So then, we will neither observe nor accept Moses. Moses is dead. His rule ended when Christ came. He is of no further service. Those are rather blunt words and rather dismissive of Moses, to say the least. So who wrote them? Well, none other than Luther. This comes from a rather significant um, sermon turned into an essay that he wrote in 1525, or preached in 1525, and then later became an essay published in 1526, called How Christians Should Regard Moses. And frankly, when people read it for the first time, even solid Lutherans, they're often shocked and sort of taken aback by what Luther says, because he's quite dismissive of Moses, and you think, how can this be? So this morning, I want to do something a little bit more um, intense or a little technical than I typically do. And if you don't want to follow along, that's fine. But some of you might be interested. Today, I want to talk to you about how to read Luther and how to hear Luther the right way. What I've learned over the years is that a lot of people misuse Luther. In fact, it's very easy to find Luther saying some rather bizarre, crazy sounding things, and you can pluck something out of Luther and make him say almost anything you like. This is happening all the time with Luther readers. And so reading Luther takes a little practice and you need to follow a few key rules. So I wanna to talk to you today about what I would consider to be three necessary rules for reading Luther. These are things that were taught to me by some of my professors, especially Dr. Bob Rosine and Dr. Bob Kolb, who really spent time pounding into my head rules for reading Luther. And my own reading of Luther has confirmed these again and again and again. So three key rules for reading Luther. And then I want to come back to this section from the essay on how Christians should regard Moses and show how these go into action and explain a little more what Luther is doing with Moses as a good illustration of these rules of reading Luther. So first rule for reading Luther, very simple, is know the context, the setting in which Luther is writing. Luther was what people call an occasional writer. This does not mean that he wrote from time to time. <laughs> Luther wrote all the time. The volume of Luther's writing is just extraordinary by any measure. He had an incredible output. And I'm sometimes really shocked when I think about the fact that he did this all with pen and quill, writing on rough paper, and just cranked out all of this stuff that went right to the printer and just blows your mind how much he wrote. So Luther wrote a lot. He's not just writing once in a while. To call Luther an occasional writer means that Luther wrote for a reason for an occasion. He wrote for a sermon. He wrote to address a problem. He wrote because someone asked him a question. He wrote to teach about some particular thing. Luther always had a reason for what he did, and often he was writing for a very particular question that was being posed or a very particular problem that had to be addressed. And so Luther's context matters enormously. When is he writing? It makes a big difference. Early in his career, the biggest concern he had was always Rome and works righteousness and the false teaching of Rome, teaching people a way to climb their way to God. And Luther was hard against this. Later in his career, things changed a little bit. And he was much more concerned about false teaching within his own circles. Antinomians who are pushing against the law so you don't need the law. Or the people who are going crazy with the radical reformation and saying, oh, it's not enough just to leave Rome. We've got to go whole hog into this kind of radical reformation and the people like Munzer and even Karlstadt who were some of the targets of what Luther's at in his Moses comments and we'll get to that more in a minute. So you need to know when he's writing and what he's pushing up against. Um, we sometimes talk in some postmodern conversations about the suppressed binary opposite or the effaced frame. In other words, who's your target? Who are you arguing against? And sometimes it's not clear. For Luther, it's usually pretty clear. It doesn't take a lot of hard work to figure out who he's writing against. So when you're reading Luther, maybe you're reading in Luther's works, and I have here volume 35 of Luther's works from the American edition, we call it, and there are a lot of volumes now in this collection. And volume 35 is on word and sacrament. That's where I was reading from about his comments on Moses, teaching about how to use the word the right way. But when you're reading Luther, you need to pay attention to the historical context, and it helps to read the introductions to the things you're reading. The American edition always has introductions, which give you some of the context and the historical setting. Read that first. Pay attention to 
What is Luther going after? So know the context, which leads into the second major rule, which is remember that Luther is a strong rhetorician. What I mean by that is he uses rhetoric really well. He uses rhetoric to make a case, and when he's making a case, he makes a case. Luther rarely does things with moderation. Not very Aristotelian of him, but he wouldn't have cared. His point is to argue an argument and push it as hard as he can to make his case strong and clear and forcefully, and he does that very well. So when Luther is making an argument, he makes his argument, and he doesn't hold back. So the idea of careful balance in an academic way, not a priority to Luther at all. He will say things to the extreme, and then he'll turn around later, sometimes within the year, and say the exact opposite just to make a point in a different argument he's making. And so that's why it's very easy to pull Luther out of context and find him saying outrageous things that support all kinds of crazy ideas which seem even mutually contradictory because they are if you don't read him in the wider context. When you read him in the wider context, things drop into place and you realize, oh, He's making a point here, and I should be careful not to read him in a crazy way, but keep my own balance going so I bring my understanding back into a right way of seeing the bigger picture and not just go off on this one thing of Luther. So always remember that Luther pushes things to the extreme for the sake of an argument. He's not a fan of balance or moderation at all. Uh, that's one of the peculiar things about Luther. He does it all the time, just pushes an argument to make his argument. So that's the second rule about reading Luther. Third rule about reading Luther then ties to that second one, which is when Luther is doing his exegesis, or in other words, his interpretation of scripture, he will often do it in ways which seem a little bit not quite right by our standards today about careful literary reading and paying attention to the meanings of words and paying attention to wider context. Luther will read a verse and simply declare, that's what this means because it suits his purpose. And so Luther's exegetical moves by standard uh, methods or standards um, of today would be frankly rather questionable. And I've seen more than one exegete often scratch his head and say, what's going on with Luther here? He's just wrong. Well, by your standards he is, but by what he is doing, he's reading scripture to find a support for something he needs to teach and he finds there in scripture and he uses it that way. And this is a whole other topic on what's the right way to use the Bible, which is being revisited, I think, in some very helpful ways of late, maybe opening the door and pushing things a little wider so we don't have such a narrow literary grammatical reading of text, but simply let the scriptures speak to the church in helpful ways. I'm kind of a fan of that. Luther exemplifies that, but he doesn't do his exegesis in ways that always ring true with current standards of good exegesis. So you need to keep that in mind. Always take Luther's exegesis with a grain of salt and be careful not to push and say, well, that's what this text means. Sometimes he's making a case and what he does with the text isn't always on track. Classic example is what he does with John 6. I don't agree with this interpretation. He says it has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper kind of hard to conscience when you look at the wider context of things. But in his context, it makes complete sense. Another great example I liked of this is when Luther says that in the Gospels, when Jesus commands the demons to be silent, because the demons are crying out and saying, you are the Son of God, what are you doing with us? Luther says, well, Luther com L Jesus commands those demons to be silent. Why? Well, because they're preaching God's Gospel without having been rightly called, which is just delightful in a sense that, yeah, Jesus doesn't want them, those demons preaching because they don't have a call to preach, so they need to be silent. Probably not the best exegetical move, but it suited Luther's purpose and it makes a nice point. So that's a good example of Luther doing exegesis his way. So now, back to what is Luther up to here with this whole Moses thing, that Moses is dead his rule ended when Christ came. He is of no further service. Boom! Done with Moses. And so the question he asked, how should Christians regard Moses? The answer is real simple. They shouldn't. But then he goes on to say, wait, wait, wait. There are three things that Moses are good for. He can be good to follow for helpful things. He points to Christ, which is great. And we have wonderful examples of the saints from Moses. And so these are three redeeming aspects. But what is going on here that would lead him to make such a dismissive charge in the first place? 
Context is key in this. It's 1525. What's going on? The peasants' revolt is going on. You've got peasants who are using Luther as an excuse, they think, to rise up against those in authority over them. And they're rebelling. Luther wants nothing to do with this. You also have the problem of Karlstadt and his over-the-top reforms in Wittenberg where he was clearing out the um, relics, not only the relics, but the artwork and the statuary from the churches because that was violating Moses' rule of no graven images. Luther can't believe what's going on. And you have others also now in Germany saying, well, these German laws that we have to follow are so harsh and so strict and so unfair, especially laws about usury and lending. We should just go back to Mosaic laws because that's God's word. And this became the key for Luther. The problem was you had these enthusiasts, these people filled without with the spirit, and Luther has no use for them. No use for Karlstadt or for Munzer. And he is making it very clear that this is a wrong reading of scripture. You can't just take Moses' teaching and plop it down into 16th century Germany and say, there you go, any more than you can do that today. You can't just pull the Old Testament and plop it down in the 21st century and say, there, that's God's word, let's do it that way. You're not reading it the right way. Let's hear Luther on this, here he makes his case. This is page 164, this volume 35. Here the law of Moses has its place. Where? The law of Moses has its place in relation to the people of Israel in the ancient world. The law of Moses is no longer binding on us, his own generation, or us 500 years later, because it was given only to the people of Israel. And Israel accepted this law for itself and its descendants, while the Gentiles were excluded. So what Luther is saying is, Moses' commandments all through the Old Testament were given only to Israel because these were the people who had to hear that word of the God, that law directing their lives at that time and at that place. Luther compares at another time to the Sachsenspiegel. The Sachsenspiegel was the law, sort of like German common law, that was governing the people of Saxony. It had been in place for hundreds of years and it was just there governing their life. Luther says, that's how you should read Moses. That was the Sachsenspiegel for the people of Israel. Govern their life. Does it apply to us? No. That's their law. We have ours, they have theirs. So we, he, that's the argument Luther's making. Now, there's more to this. To be sure, the Gentiles have certain laws in common with the Jews, such as these. There is one God. No one is to do wrong to another. No one is to commit adultery or murder or steal and others like them. This is written by nature into their hearts. They did not hear it straight from heaven as the Jews did from Sinai. This is why this entire text does not pertain to the Gentiles. I say this on account of the enthusiast. For you see and hear how they read Moses, extol him, and bring up the way he ruled the people with commandments. They try to be clever and think they know something more than is presented in the gospel. So they minimize faith, contrive something new, and boastfully claim that it comes from the Old Testament. They desire to govern people according to the letter of the law of Moses as if no one had ever read it before. So in other words, the enthusiasts are forgetting that we are Gentiles living in faith before Christ according to God's will as expressed in our time frame. And they're instead trying to take Moses and drop him into today. And Luther says, no, 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 no. Now, the critical thing here is to recognize the commonality. What's commonality is the law written on our hearts. In other words, the natural law. The natural law is what guides and directs everybody living, and then that natural law, let me clear on this, natural law is not somehow some sort of secret law that only a few people discover. Natural law is not what we feel in our hearts. Natural law is really the creational law. It's the law that God built into the fabric of the very universe itself that just governs how everything works. And these things are universally true. Out of that creational natural law foundation grow the applications or the the um, way that it works into our particular context. So for Israel, there are all kinds of commandments for them and their situation, the law of Israel, the law of Moses, growing out of that natural law. For the Germans living in the 16th century, there was this Sachsenspiegel, which grew out of that foundation of the natural law. 
for us living in the 21st century, in America or Canada or India, wherever you are living, Finland, this law that we live by in our region grows out of that same natural law. And laws can be judged as good or bad to the degree that they cohere with this foundational, creational, natural law. So where does Moses fit? Well, Moses then is giving expression of God's will for his people at that time and place, foundationally grounded in the natural law. Those parts that are grounded in natural law, we continue to hear and apply. But those parts that are only for Israel, we don't apply the same way. Third commandment, great example. Do we still have to follow the rules about not working? Jesus made it clear, nope, doesn't apply in that same way anymore. But now, the natural law of truth is still there. We need to honor God, hear His Word, celebrate the creation around us, and spend time delighting in what He's given us. That's key to what we do as His people, no matter when we're living. But the details can apply differently in different times and places. So, why do we dismiss Moses? Because he's for the people of Israel in the ancient world. And yet, Moses still applies to the extent that he gives expression to the natural law and the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, give a perfect expression to that natural law, which is why they are universally studied and universally applied, even though they also are part of that law only for Israel, and yet the natural law aspects do still apply. So there you have a classic example of how you take Luther's ways of operating and what I consider to be the three rules of reading Luther, know his context, know how he operates with his pushing an argument, and then take his exegesis always with a grain of salt. We can see these applied here and it makes sense of what Luther's doing and we see how he is faithful to the proclamation of God's truth even as he is making some rather discreet moves for his particular time and place. Hope this helps in your reading of Luther and helps guide you forward as you read more of Luther to pay attention to what's going on and learn to hear him the right way.